Hello, I'm Jeff Sachs, director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University and special advisor to United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on the Millennium Development Goals. I'm extremely honored uh, to uh, be giving the uh, Richard Kapuczynski lectures uh, uh, together uh, with the many distinguished people who have been part of this important uh, series of lectures on development. And it's my pleasure to discuss uh, in this context uh, the new age of development, uh, an age of sustainable development. Uh, we have reached a, a period in the world where traditional patterns of economic development will no longer suffice uh, and where we need new uh, and holistic approaches to development that are far more resonant with the real challenges uh, that humanity faces. Uh, it's a particular honor to be part of a series uh, in memory and honor of uh, Richard uh, Kapuczynski, uh, a great journalist with a unique uh, eye for the world and a capacity to understand change. Uh, often change of the very hard kind, the collapse of regimes, uh, the need for fundamental reorientation, uh, whether uh, in uh, Ethiopia or in Iran or in the Soviet Union, Kapuczynski uh, had uh, an incredibly discerning eye, uh, partly uh, based uh, on his remarkable own life history. Uh, of uh, navigating uh, in the post-World War II communist uh, system of Poland. But uh, for whatever it is, his innate talents, uh, his life experience, his world travels, uh, he brought uh, a clarity of vision to the world and uh, an ability to pierce through the surface that is inspiring, um, also entertaining, by the way, to read his wonderful works, uh, but also a kind of a target or standard for all of us to aspire to. So I was absolutely delighted to be asked to participate in this series. I want to speak about the new age of sustainable development because while the concept of sustainable development has really been on the world stage for at least a quarter century, the urgency of sustainable development as a concept uh, is taking on an unprecedented uh, importance uh, and stature these days. And this is because the world, uh, a bit late because it could have known earlier, is coming to the realization that the economic model that has been driving the world economy for the last, say, three decades really has reached its limits and we need rather urgently a new direction. Why do I say this? Well, economic growth, the uh, usual shorthand metric for economic development, uh, has uh, been relatively good for the last uh, two to three decades, even though it has of course been punctuated by many crises and by big divergences in uh, national and regional experiences around the world. But I think it's fair to say that the period dated back to the late 1970s when Deng Xiaoping first opened China to the international economy and to market forces, uh, to 1989 to 1991 when the old Soviet communist system collapsed uh, and uh, Europe at least was uh, reunited uh, politically uh, and economically, even though that may sound a little bit ironic in the current crises, I think it's still true to say in broad historical terms, to the increasing integration of the world economy uh, even in the last uh, dozen or so years, which has seen an improvement in performance of some significance in Africa, all of this period of the last 30-some years has been a period of 
economic progress, albeit extremely uneven. Poverty rates have declined from uh, more than 50% of the population of developing countries in 1980 to around 44% of the population of the developing countries in 1990 uh, to a poverty rate of perhaps 20% of the population of developing countries as of today. The Millennium Development Goal of cutting poverty by half between 1990 and 2015 has been achieved if one takes the developing world as a whole. Of course, China has been the great uh, impetus uh, beyond, behind this uh, overall achievement. But it bears saying that the world economy has allowed for a measure of economic convergence of poor countries, a kind of catching up uh, that has been quite important. And while East Asia has been the great uh, success story in this period, other parts of the world have experienced real economic progress and progress in other measurable areas such as uh, the decline of infant and child mortality rates, the decline of maternal mortality rates, the rising proportions of children attending school, uh, the improvements of infrastructure, the massive spread of mobile telephony, uh, and uh, internet connectivity, and so forth. Well, why then do we need a new uh, strategy of development if uh, this is the case? The answer is that the period from 1978, say, till 2008, uh, maybe that 30-year period, which might be called the age of globalization because it was the period when the world economy really came together when developing countries, former Soviet-style communist countries, and the high-income countries of the United States, Europe, and Japan integrated in production systems, in trade, and finance. Uh, that period produced growth, but it produced growth of a very lopsided manner. Two things are glaringly out of place. Uh, in the growth of the 30 years from 1978 to 2008. First, the growth was highly uneven within countries and across countries. And to an important extent, there was a significant rise of inequality of income and wealth within many, many parts of the world economy. In China, which had the fastest growth in the world during this period, there was also a very sharp widening of the inequality between rich and poor. In the United States, a historic widening of inequality. In many other parts of the world, uh, similarly. There are many deep reasons for this. They're not fully understood, certainly uh, not a matter of consensus. We think that technological change played some role. Uh, in favoring skilled workers vis-a-vis -vis unskilled workers. We think globalization played some role in shifting uh, demands for labor uh, across the world. Uh, politics uh, certainly played its role in uh, countries uh, like my own, the United States, where the rich were increasingly favored by public policies. Globalization in an institutional sense played a role by favoring tax havens and ways for the rich and powerful corporations to shelter their income and become uh, even more powerful outside of the gaze and control of regulators. Whatever the reasons and the allocation among those many factors, income inequality widens significantly. And some countries simply didn't get on a path of development at all and remained mired in a poverty trap. The second lopsided aspect of the 30 years of growth from 1978 to 2008 was the growing environmental crisis. We can't say we weren't warned. It was already back in 1972 when the first International Conference on the Environment and Development in Stockholm when the world was put on notice that we were on a collision course between the 
style of economic growth underway with its heavy resource use and heavy dependence on fossil fuels and a world environment that could not withstand the geometrically rising pressures imposed by humanity. Well, those were early warnings back in 1972. Also, not very precise ones because one could hear the distant thunder, but one could not necessarily discern exactly the cause. Limits to growth back in 1972, by, produced by the Club of Rome, argued that the rapid economic growth in the world would hit planetary limits, but it wasn't very clear or even very accurate of exactly how. Many economists derided that study. I praise it deeply. Not that it got everything right, but that it did point out that in a world of rapid economic growth and finite ecological and resource limits, there's bound to be trouble unless the style of growth is resource saving rather than heavily resource using. Alas, our style of economic development has been resource using, using the space in the atmosphere to absorb greenhouse gases, using the oceans to absorb carbon dioxide, thereby acidifying the oceans, using the land heavily to be cleared for crops and for pasture land, to cut down trees uh, for tropical hardwood, uh, to uh, replace uh, natural rainforest with the uh, massive palm oil uh, plantations, and a thousand other anthropogenic changes to the physical environment. The bottom line is that the economic growth model of the age of, uh, age of globalization, as I've called it, uh, really built uh, sharp contradictions that we are now confronting sharp contradictions of massive inequalities of wealth, income, and power, and sharp contradictions in the form of ecological systems under great and growing duress, even as our economy continues to increase its demands of natural resources and its pressures on physical ecosystems. All of this has caused the world's governments to come back once again to the concept of sustainable development. That concept, popularized first by the Brundtland Commission in 1987, at the center of the Earth Summit in 1992, has not yet fully changed, I shouldn't even say fully, has not yet changed human behavior and has not yet deeply penetrated uh, the consciousness of uh, policy makers and publics around the world, but it is focused on something extremely important. As an analytical idea, sustainable development means the understanding of the interconnections of complex economic, social, and environmental dynamics. It's an analytical approach to complex human physical interactions. As a normative ethical or moral idea, it is a call for a holistic approach to a decent society. One that is chasing not money per se, but is chasing a balance of economic well-being, social inclusion, including more equality of economic opportunity, high social mobility, less discrimination against minorities uh, and uh, other discriminated groups and, and women and, and girls still in many societies, and consonance with the needs of the physical ecosystems, with the climate, with the water cycle, with the nitrogen cycle, with the health of major ecosystems. So sustainable development in this sense is both a, an analytical approach to understanding economic, social, and environmental interactions and a normative approach that calls for a more balanced approach to life, to public policy, and to development strategy. We need that. When one looks at our situation today, 
and looking at some of these rather grim pictures, buildings uh, being swept away by the massive floods in Sichuan province this summer. My own city, New York, uh, where the police cars are floating down the street after Superstorm Sandy hit in late October, early November of 2012 with a storm surge of unprecedented ferocity because the sea level had increased by one foot during the 20th century, meaning that the huge storm that hit the eastern seaboard was able to cause thereby massive derangement and flooding conditions uh, as you see here. Or just as the east coast was experiencing massive flooding, the big center of the United States was experiencing a mega drought, a drought which continues in many parts of the United States till today. You see here uh, the death of the maize crop uh, in uh, the summer of 2012 in this uh, horrendous drought which was also accompanied by a massive heat wave. Both the drought and the heat wave having strong signals of human-induced change in them. And a year later, uh, we see the billboard uh, over uh, St. Louis uh, in the 109 degree Fahrenheit, 43 degree centigrade burden uh, that uh, yet another heat wave uh, imposed on the United States in the summer of 2013. And of course, that has led to drying, to a spread of forest fires uh, as uh, hit Arizona, for example, this year. Every part of the world uh, is experiencing more dislocations, more environmental instability, heat waves, floods, drought, extreme storms, flood surges uh, that are causing huge dislocations at an increasing rate. And it's not only our sense, of course, uh, it is strongly showing up in detailed analyses of, uh, of uh, the frequency and intensity of these uh, shocks. And the evidence is very clear that what used to be extraordinarily rare events have now become almost commonplace events. We've entered an era of instability, an era that is uh, so uh, new and so troubling for humanity that geologists have given it a new name, a new epoch of the planet. As you know, uh, a, the new name is the Anthropocene, the human-caused epoch of Earth. When one species, us, uh, is uh, changing the Earth in so many fundamental ways, uh, in climate system, and water cycle, and nitrogen cycle, and phosphorus cycle, and ocean acidity, uh, in extreme events, in uh, loss of biodiversity, in invasive species, that we are transforming the planet, the one that gives us life support. Perhaps uh, the starkest illustration of this is shown in this graph, which became well known around April of uh, 2013, when it was announced that carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere had reached the level of 400 parts per million CO2, meaning that every 400 of the million molecules in the atmosphere is a CO2 molecule. What is remarkable about that, as shown in this graph, is that for three million years, the Earth has not seen this level of carbon dioxide concentration. What you see on this particular graph, dating back from 800,000 years before the present on the left-hand side, all the way to the present, is a kind of sawtooth cycling of CO2 levels between 150 and 250 parts per million. Those are natural cycles of CO2 driven mainly by orbital changes uh, of the Earth. But then suddenly, just at the very end of the graph, close to zero, in other words, close to the present day, the CO2 line shoots straight up vertically. 
What it means is that within the last 50 years, just the blink of an eye in terms of the Earth's history and human history, the CO2 levels shot through their natural cycling bounded by roughly 250 to 300 parts per million all the way up to 400 parts per million. It's no secret what this is about, of course. This is the result of burning of coal, oil, and gas in the modern economic age, the age of fossil fuels. And at 400 parts per million, on its way to 450, 500 parts per million, within the next 25, 30, 40 years, we're also on a path of raising Earth's temperature on average by three, four, even five degrees centigrade this century. The ecologists, the Earth scientists have told us, don't do this. Two degrees centigrade is already a dangerous limit because in the past when the Earth is warmed by two degrees centigrade, sea levels have been far higher. Risks to the ice sheets in Antarctica and Greenland are very great. There could be massive dislocations in the Earth's ecosystems, big die-offs of uh, species, losses of coral, acidification of the oceans through the dissolving of CO2 into uh, the ocean level. And here we are on a path not to limits of 400 or even 450 parts per million, which many scientists, including many of my colleagues, regard as already far too dangerous, but going up, shooting way past that within a few decades to 500, 550, 600 parts per million CO2 and all of the climate change that that portends. The Anthropocene has a sister idea shown here uh, from a well-known article in 2009 uh, of ecologists led by Johan Rugström of the Stockholm Resiliency Center uh, in Sweden, arguing that it's not just the CO2 or the greenhouse gas concentrations, but many other features of human activity that are pressing against planetary bounds of safety. These ecologists op identified what they called the safe operating space for humanity and said that there are boundaries, whether it's the boundary of CO2 levels or the boundary of ocean acidity or the boundary of land use or the boundary of nitrogen uh, flux caused by the reactive nitrogen that humanity is putting on our crops to grow food. We are pressing against planetary boundaries on several fronts. The point is that economic development of the old style, based on heavy natural resource use, heavy impositions on ecosystems, is putting us in enormous peril. And this peril is illustrated by this graph showing the rising uh, numbers of disasters in recent years. And this isn't only because of better reporting, this is because the increased frequency of extreme events is accompanying the human-induced changes on the planet. We are reaching, therefore, a crisis with the old model, even as economic development has proceeded effectively, the imbalances of income and wealth, the rising inequalities, the greater stresses on the physical environment, the instability of the food supply and the hunger that it has entailed uh, in various places is not only causing a growing uh, moral crisis, it's also increasing political instability. Look at these pictures from around the world, whether it's Tunis, Cairo, Athens, Tel Aviv, Chile, New York, Madrid, Istanbul, Rio, uh, protests uh, of young people around the world protesting rising income inequality, joblessness for uh, a rising proportion of young people, instability, high food prices, occasioned also by the ecological shocks. 
what to do about it. The point is that the world needs now to take sustainable development, not as an interesting concept, uh, not uh, as a, a phrase to be invoked once every 20 years at a conference in Rio or on its anniversary 20 years later, but as a centerpiece for the development agenda. This, I hope, is what the UN member states are gearing up to accomplish. They promised themselves and the world at the time of the Rio Plus 20 summit in June 2012 that the world's governments would adopt sustainable development goals to encompass the holistic approach of economic, social, and environmental objectives harnessed in an integrated manner. These sustainable development goals will be universal, applying to all countries, will be a few in number so that they can be mobilizers of the broad population around the world and can be used to hold governments accountable. At the core of sustainable development goals are four crucial dimensions. I've mentioned three of them. Economic development, including the end of poverty. Social inclusion, meaning both the uh, end of discrimination by gender, race, ethnicity, geography, but also greater equality of opportunity and higher social mobility, in part coming from a guaranteed access of every child to a chance for a decent future, even if that child's born into a poor household, to environmental sustainability, the three broad pillars of sustainable development, but all necessarily underpinned by good governance, accountability, transparency, responsibility, of government and of the business sector, because good governance is, isn't only about politics, it's also about corporate governance, especially in a world where corporations play such a major role. We need to work then for our governments in the United Nations to reach soon a consensus around a small, highly pertinent, prioritized set of sustainable development goals. These would include decarbonizing the energy system so that we avoid the worst of human-induced climate change, major advances of energy efficiency, improvements of transport, healthier and more resilient cities, sustainable agriculture to protect our food supply and ensure that we can meet a growing population, protection of the oceans and other biomes that are directly threatened by human activity, and good governance for sustainable development at all levels, local, national, global, and also across sectors of the economy. Can we accomplish such big goals? Does it make sense even to adopt ambitions of this holistic approach when they seem so daunting? I think the answer is overwhelmingly yes. Just like the Millennium Development Goals have greatly accelerated progress in the fight against disease, hunger, and poverty, and they've helped to unleash a new era of development in Africa, which was mired in poverty and with little hope up to the year 2000. So too could Sustainable Development Goals draw on a wealth of new technologies, the revolutions in information technology, new nano and materials sciences, new breakthroughs in genomics and agronomics that give us the chance indeed to change course from a business as usual of heavy resource using, uh, resource using development to a pathway of sustainable development. We have breakthroughs in solar energy and wind energy, uh, near breakthroughs in ways to store these intermittent power sources. Advances such as shown here in uh, a new BMW electric vehicle uh, with the promising uh, long distance capacity. Shifting from the internal combustion engine to electric vehicles could 
play a huge role uh, in uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions as long as that electricity grid on which cars like this are charged is itself running on low carbon energy. There could be, as shown here, carbon capture and sequestration technologies on the books in uh, demonstration projects such as this one, but needing to be scaled up. Far more efficient uh, transport uh, such as uh, this uh, maglev uh, famous uh, rapid train uh, from Shanghai to uh, the airport uh, showing how 21st century clean, rapid transportation is feasible with breakthroughs in technology. Or this large solar array uh, exemplifying the rapid uptake of photovoltaics which have fallen hugely in cost, roughly by a factor of 100 from 1977 till now, from around $77 per watt uh, in uh, 1977 to around 70 cents a watt uh, today with the big advances uh, in uh, material science uh, that uh, have come about. And new and innovative ways to protect ecosystems as well as to protect humanity. Uh, I admire uh, this new highly innovative project uh, carried out in the Netherlands, the very uh, famous Eastern uh, Scheldt Barrier, uh, which is a way for the Netherlands to protect itself from rising ocean levels and major storms, but with a, a flexible design that allows for normal ecosystem functions in the great estuaries, but then in which the gates of this barrier close in the event of threatening storm surges and rising ocean levels. In other words, the Netherlands invent, invested very heavily uh, in a long-term program of true sustainable development by creating new technologies consistent with conservation of ecosystems, but also consistent with conservation, preservation of human life and, uh, and livelihoods. All of this is to say that sustainable development must be our choice. That's why I call it a new age of sustainable development. The business as usual trajectory on which we have been operating has done some very important uh, things for human well-being, especially reducing extreme poverty but it's left imbalances that are so severe now that they must be addressed with urgency. We can, by cooperation, by a moral approach, an ethical approach to public policy, and by invoking and benefiting from new technological breakthroughs, have a balanced approach to global development one that combines the economic progress that countries around the world yearn for with social justice, high extent of social mobility, and environmental sustainability, all underpinned by good governance. That, I hope, will be the content of the sustainable development goals that will help carry us forward in the period between 2015 and 2030. With clear goals, I think we can have the result that John Kennedy called for when he defined clear goal setting for peace 50 years ago. In his famous quest for peace in 1963, which culminated in the partial nuclear test ban treaty, President Kennedy said, by defining our goal more clearly, by helping it seem more manageable and less remote, we help all people to see it, to draw hope from it, and to move irresistibly toward it. It's time for us to define clearly the goal of sustainable development so that people can draw hope from it and to move irresistibly toward it. Our planet needs it. The poor in this world need it. Future generations need it. We are stewards. It is our responsibility. Let's move forward together to a new age of sustainable development.